The multilateral community can send signals. Governments have to implement policies, but companies are the ones who deliver on this in, you know, in terms of investment dollars, in terms of transitioning the energy system. And so I think you'll see a lot of focus on, you know, from the U.S. in particular, about trying to tie those things together. Good day, everyone. Welcome and, and thank you for joining today's edition of Taneo Insights. I'm Kevin Kajiwara, co-president of Taneo Political Risk Advisory in New York City. Later this month, on the 31st, the United Nations Climate Change Conference, better known as COP26, will be held in Glasgow, Scotland. And this conference is the first time uh, that countries are meant to commit to enhanced uh, ambitions since the Paris Agreement in 2015. And while the world has placed very great importance on the meetings, some climate activists and critics, people like Greta Thunberg and others remain deeply skeptical because while multilateral agreements can be made, enforcement is challenging um, when execution is dependent on the political will and the reality and the accountability in each individual country. And to that point, the three biggest players coming into COP26 are of course, the United States, China, and the EU, which itself represents 27 uh, different countries. And the reality it is, is that without these three leading by example, the world will not come close to preventing Earth's average temperature from increasing two degrees Celsius from pre-industrial levels by the end of the century, which is considered a catastrophic threshold. So today we're going to consider the perspectives, the ambitions, and the political and economic limitations uh, of these three critical players and I'm joined today by an outstanding pa uh, panel of experts. Monica Frassoni brings over 30 years of experience in European politics, including two mandates as a member of the European Parliament from 1999 to 2009, uh, and then 10 years as co-president of the European Green Party. She has served as the president of the European Alliance to Save Energy and is the president uh, of the European Center for Electoral Support. She's also a Taneo senior advisor. Uh, she joins us today from Brussels. Michal Madan is in London. She is the director of the China Energy Program and the director of the Gas Research Program at the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies. She's held senior uh, roles at Energy Aspects and China Matters. And uh, in a previous life, years ago, she and I uh, she and I worked together, and it's it's a real pleasure to have to work with you again here today, uh, Michal. And Sarah Ladislaw joins us from near Washington, D.C. She's a managing director and heads the U.S. program uh, at the Rocky Mountain Institute, which is dedicated to accelerating uh, the clean energy transition uh, and, and improving lives. Previously, she was the director of the uh, Energy Security and Climate Change Program at CSIS. Um, and um, she has been on the other side, though. She also did a stint at Statoil. So uh, thank all of you for, for joining me for this uh, discussion of this enormous, uh, enormous issue. So I'll, I want to start by sort of setting the table here a bit as we, uh, as we head into COP26 and, and ask you each about the countries or regions that you're representing today here. And what are the real, you know, what are the real objectives heading into COP26? And what can we reasonably expect uh, of each of them individually and as and as leaders, and I think equally importantly, what's constraining their room for uh, for maneuver? And I would I would note that here we are on the eve of COP26, and we have gotten very dramatic examples just in the last couple of weeks of, of increasing gas prices and energy shortages in many parts of the world at a moment of increased concern about inflation overall and the impact that this is going to have on, um, on electorates as we try to continue our recovery from, uh, from the pandemic um, uh, recessions. So let's start with the overview first, and maybe Monica, you can start um, with, the, with the European perspective. Yes, good morning, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here and share this uh, panel with two outstanding uh, panelists. So um, I would say that uh, the ambition of the uh, European Union considering that, as you said, there are some divisions inside, but uh, just yesterday, the EU approved the mandate for the COP26, so we can reasonably say that there is uh, unity behind uh, 
uh, certain agreements. But the main goal is to make sure that the uh, COP26 uh, keep the climate ambition as a global uh, effort. Um, and in order to do that, uh, we have, of course, to sort out the finance, but also to make sure that the national determined contributions are serious. And I think that this issue of striving to make, to keep the um, uh, Paris Agreement there is, uh, means also to keep the ambition of, uh, of, the, of the target of 1.5 uh, degrees as maximum element, uh, uh, the threshold of, uh, um, of global warming. And I think that these are the three main goals of the European Union. Uh, inside there, there are, of course, uh, different approaches. There are some who want to go faster, some who want to, who want to go slower. Those who say, if this uh, agreement does not remain global, then why, you know, to launch as uh, so uh, ambitious uh, policies and targets? But in general, I would say that these are the targets that everybody shares in the European Union, and that is why it is so important uh, that the, the United States are on board in this conversation, and also that there is a way through which the dialogue with China remains positive. I think that the biggest uh, th uh, risk that is today seen is uh, the behavior of China and India, uh, but also the impatience, if you want, of developing countries uh, in terms of, uh, of finance, which, of course, I share totally. Exactly. Uh, Michal, why don't we move on to, to China and, um, you know, and, and their ambitions coming in and, and, and what's limiting their maneuver. Yeah, thank you, Kevin. It's, it's fantastic to be here with old and new friends and, and colleagues. I think just to set the scene, what I wanted to do, and it refers a lot to what Monica was just saying, is talk about, I guess, three ambiguities or juxtapositions in China's position coming into COP26 and how it will be perceived. I think the first point is really views about the level of ambition and the speed of implementation, because Beijing is coming into this wanting some recognition for very ambitious pledges. From China's perspective, the, the 3060 targets, right, to peak emissions before 2030 and to reach net zero by 2060 are hugely transformative and challenging for the Chinese economy, even though there are, of course, opportunities. Uh, now, we have to note that they haven't submitted these as NDCs yet, and we still have three weeks to go, so we'll see what China officially submits. It's unlikely to differ massively from these pledges, but of course, from a climate perspective and from a Western perspective, this isn't enough, right? China, the ambition is that, or the hope is that China will strive for net zero by 2050 and a clear commitment to end coal both inside of China and abroad. So I think this could become an issue. It's not just about the theatrics or the politics of Glasgow, but of course, there's also a real issue for Western companies operating in China that have made pledges that need to meet certain targets um, and need that to be the case in China as well. And if China is on a slower trajectory or the taxonomies are different, that is complicating. That's a complicated factor, sort of beyond COP. The second sort of juxtaposition or, or ambiguity is developing versus developed countries. China has always championed the sort of notion of common but differentiated responsibilities. It's really positioned itself as the leader of the G77, the developing world. Um, and, you know, I think Paris tried to get away from that with NDCs and sort of everybody sharing the commitment. But in the Glasgow context, I think the question of financing will be critical and China will want to, again, position itself as a leader demanding more financing from developed countries. And of course, it is slightly ironic that Chinese companies could benefit quite a bit from this financing. Um, that will come. Also, the issue of carbon tariffs, the EU's um, carbon border adjustment mechanism, all of these could become north-south issues because, of course, they weigh on the competitiveness of, of developing economies. And the third sort of ambiguity is multilateral versus unilateral action. China's pledge, um, of course, has generated a huge amount of momentum with Japan and South Korea issuing net zero pledges. And, and of course, this is Finally, the US, Europe, and China are on the same page in terms of ambition. Um, but China did issue its pledges unilaterally, not with the EU, not with the US, like it did in 2015. And I think it is signaling very clearly that while it is engaged in this multilateral process, it is going it alone. Now, again, that's a good thing because, because I think you know, China's demonstrating that 
it doesn't have this issue of administration switching over and their commitment maybe wavering. It is dedicated and committed. But there's also, of course, the context of potential technological financial decoupling. If we're in a world where we're competing for leadership of this process, it might not be conducive for the process when we think about the recreation of supply chains, uh, the fragmentation of, of sort of interregions. Um, that's a complicated regulatory environment for companies, but again, it's just not necessarily conducive to an effective and efficient transition. So let me follow up on, uh, on, on something you just said really quickly here. Um, you know, you, you essentially referred to the pledges that, that Xi Jinping um, had made, and, and one of the complications, obviously, that that we find in Europe and in the United States and in other places, obviously, as democracies, they're messy. There's a lot of cooks in the kitchen, uh, in a sense. Um, but increasingly, uh, you know, in all aspects of Chinese policymaking, Xi Jinping, uh, you know, makes pledges, and then it is, it, it, it is, you know, it, we should we should basically believe what he is saying. The question, I guess, then is, what's the transition transmission mechanism from these? high-level commitments to actually uh, implementing them, um, you know, at an industrial level, at a state or provincial level, et cetera, especially when a lot of provincial leaders trying to make their way through the hierarchy of the Chinese Communist Party and the like have got these kind of contradictory, um, you know, requirements of them to bring down emissions on the one hand, but also maintain economic growth. How, do, how are they reconciling that and how, how efficient, let's put it this way, is that you know, policy pronouncement to actual implementation transmission in China in general? I think that's the key question, right, from now until, well, 2060, because I think there is that perception, Xi Jinping says, and so it goes, and it does to a certain degree. Um, and there is sort of the, 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 the hand of the state that guides outcomes very clearly. Now, I think we have to bear in mind that we, they could lead to effective outcomes, not necessarily economically efficient outcomes. But I do think that this issue of mixed signals, I would argue that the energy crisis that we are seeing right now in China is not the outcome of high coal prices. It is the outcome of mixed signals um, because provinces have been told to reduce energy intensity in their energy consumption. And they're actually using this as a way to, I guess, accelerate an industrial restructuring. But economic growth is extremely rapid. And to a certain degree, it feels like a little bit of political pushback with the provinces saying, look, you told us to cut energy emissions and and energy use. And so if you change the narrative now, fine, but you know, what are you telling us here? And so I think these are exactly the kinds of, of the volatility, both in, in the Chinese market when there's volatility, it has ripple, but this is exactly the challenge of a transition that is, I guess, caught between the plan and the market. Right. So Sarah, let's, let me ask you now the, the establishing question from the United States' perspective. Um, and I would just note, you know, we were talking about the, the sort of uh, energy market um, uh, dislocations that we have seen in various parts of the world uh, of late. And we find ourselves in this kind of ironic position right now where we, the United States, the, the, the Biden administration trying to, to lead on energy transition. Yet at the same time, President Biden is calling on producers to increase supply um, uh, of hydrocarbon production. So talk about the U.S. going into COP26. Yeah, thanks very much, and thanks for having me. It's really a pleasure to be part of this discussion. I, I think a couple of different things. I mean, one really clear signal that the Biden administration has tried to send, which is important to note that it's the Biden administration signal, is that they are trying to make up for lost political time, right? So this idea that the U.S., you know, everybody knows we have sort of a political inconsistency in our position on climate. I would say the window on that shifts over time and has been narrowing, but obviously, you know, when it comes to the pace and scale of the energy transition, the United States is not on the same uh, on the same footing. And so the Biden administration came in trying to say, hey, listen, we are making up for lost time. We were not talking about this at high diplomatic levels for the last four years. We want to be able to do that going forward. And so I think that's what they've spent the last, uh, you know, 12 months or the, the preceding 12 months before the, this COP trying to do, which is really re-energize the multilateral apparatus with as much energy as the U.S. government could put into that, uh, it, it, into, into, into those talks. You saw this in the G7 and the G20. They resurrected the major economies forum. Uh, so they're really trying to give the sort of 
you know, multilateral yeah. process and tools. And it is actually quite helpful because we just went through a global pandemic. You watched the lead up to the COP kind of, you know, it's hard to maintain momentum for a COP in the wake of a global pandemic. And it's hard to maintain the sort of, you know, the 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 willingness to really act with that kind of passion with the world's major economies, you know, sitting out on the sidelines. So really tried very hard. And I think their objective in this COP uh, is to try to make it as uh, as as impactful as possible. That being said, I also think that they are, along with other world leaders, really trying to turn the page. Like we have to stop this thing that we do where we look at COPs as turning points. That is not the stage in this process that we're in. This needs to be every single day, our objective, like quarterly earnings and like the bottom line of our political cycle, like we need to be focusing on, are we delivering against this challenge? We're not at the stage anymore where 2050 targets or 2030 targets in and of themselves are going to be adequate. And so I really think that one of the objectives is to try very hard to make this COP a turning point in that narrative, right? So like from here on out, how are we focusing on this issue uh, every day? And when you think about it, the multilateral community can send signals, governments have to implement policies, but companies are the ones who deliver on this in, you know, in terms of investment dollars, in terms of transitioning the energy system. And so I think you'll see a lot of focus on, you know, from the US in particular, about trying to tie those things together, right? Do we have the signals? Do we have the policies? Do we have the investment follow through to make sure that that's the process that we're fulfilling? I think it's really challenging also, though, for the United States, because obviously we have a bit of a credibility gap in terms of you know, federal policy and national leadership. I do think it's important to look beyond federal policy and national leadership to assess the position that the U.S. is going to be going into with this COP. We have you know, the world's uh, largest financiers. We have innovative companies and corporations. Many of them have uh, the right targets and are trying to pursue a net zero uh, you know, ambitions by 2050. And we've got a lot of state and local communities that also have these contributions. And I think the other, uh, excuse me, these targets and these ambitions. So I, I think that it's important to, to take the whole picture of the United States into account when we think about what the US is bringing to the table. Am I saying that we're on the path to reach, you know, one and a half degree alignment? Nope. But are we, you know, perhaps better than our national politics would uh, would belie? I think that's I think that's true. I, I think what the Biden administration in particular is trying to do uh, to to sort of bolster U.S. credibility in in these and other multilateral talks is to really change the narrative on why the U.S. is pursuing these climate objectives not necessarily for the, the, the good of the climate, but, but certainly for the good of the US economy and our future competitiveness. And you see them really hammering home on this all the time. Um, it can cause tensions as Mikhail also alluded to, which I hope we can get into a little bit later, but I do think it is the strategy for trying to not just make you know, the American public, which is generally in favor of doing positive things for the climate on a you know, mass polling basis, but actually make them really want this transition because they see the concrete benefits that it brings to their community. And that's how I think that over you know, the course of the administration, they're hoping to bolster their credibility. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. But let me, before we sort of move on to the next phase of this conversation, let me just ask you to go into a little more detail on something you just kind of brought up there. Because essentially if, what I'm hearing you're saying is, is that we tend to think of decarbonization as an end and it's a necessary end. But it's actually, it's also a means as the U.S. attempts to, you know, uh, reassert global leadership here. And, um, but, but clearly, you know, you've made this point of our inconsistency over, over time. And we've got to show some domestic results really here to have credibility as a reminder to everybody in the 1997 Kyoto Protocols. You know, the problem was binding uh, obligations only applied to to developed countries and not to china not to india etc and george w bush didn't didn't sign um and 2015 paris uh all parties had obligations that's better obviously but um but but voluntary pledges with no real enforcement mechanism and of course uh president trump pulled us out of that uh, withdrew from that uh anyway so talk about the credibility problem then that say john Kerry has as he goes around trying to not only deliver this message of U.S. leadership, but also that 
you know, behind him, there is a, that there is some consistency in the direction of travel of the United States and its component parts, federal government and the agencies and individual companies and, and states and, 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 and local jurisdictions. Yeah, I think it's a really important point, and, and it doesn't it doesn't make the challenge go away. Let's just be clear and honest about that, right? I mean, I do think if the U.S. is putting itself out there as a global leader, leading and like showing what it means to decarbonize at pace is a challenge that none of us have achieved yet, right? So we have to all sort of own the fact that we're not on track. I do think, though, it is important to look at the history of the U.S. in terms of what it's contributed to the creation of clean energy technologies or driving down emissions in the U.S. system through efficiency and clean energy deployment and coal to gas switching. There's a lot of things that like we're all going to have to do together and learn together about how to make a clean energy transition work. And I do think the U.S. has broadly a decent track record on the contributions that it has made to that challenge. And so I do think when you when you look at the full scale of what it means for the U.S. to show up at COP and show up in these multilateral moments and try to exhibit U.S. leadership, you have to look at what the companies are bringing to the table. You have to look at what California is bringing to the table or New York is bringing to the table, places that are sort of genuinely trying to reach these targets that are at a sub-national, non-federal level that are really good examples of, of, of trying to grapple with the, the challenges. Um, and, and quite frankly, you know, I was just listening to Governor Newsom on, the, the, on a news show this week. Um, you're talking about how green jobs in the state of California are now five times what fossil energy jobs are, you know, really trying to make it, it, it very clear that in those states and in some parts of the country, this is now being regarded as an economic opportunity. And I think that that's something that can be generally very positive if, if that is true, uh, that we stop looking at this clean energy transition as a sunk cost as an investment that has to be made and an economic opportunity that is out there to be gained. You know, Mikhail, I know you've done an, an awful lot of work on, on, on markets and, and I wanna ask sort of a two part question on the markets front that you see. I mean, on the one hand, are, are markets reflecting risk adequately here uh, or are we really prone to sudden, uh, to sudden shocks? I mean, not only the transition risk, uh, but even just the, the near, nearer term impact risk on fires and floods, uh, salt intrusion on agriculture, erosion, et cetera, you know, this impact on the bottom, uh, on the bottom line um, or how, uh, how insurance, uh, insurance companies are going to price risk going forward, et cetera. You know, um, are, are markets pricing risk uh, adequately, number one? But number two, on the on the other side, um, the other market question here is, is that it comes to carbon pricing, right? I mean, economists will maintain that the fastest and most cost effective way uh, to cut emissions is is via carbon pricing, that subsidies and, and 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 regulations ultimately are inefficient. They lead to higher taxes and deficits and, and the like. So it's better to have the market determine winners and losers and losers in a sense. What is your sense of the market dynamic uh, here right now that countries ought to be aware of? I feel like I'm back uh, 10 years ago with, with Kevin asking all the tough questions. <laughs> I, I think markets are increasingly reflecting the risk, right? What we're seeing now in Europe and the current gas crisis is in part this reflection of, of course, short-term strains and and the kind of the, the gas supply demand balances, but part of that is also that renewables have underperformed, right? That's been the case everywhere in the world. And so that is kind of priced in because the supply is not there in part because of renewables. I think increasingly it is starting to show at kind of the front end of the curve on what's happening in, in prices and markets now, but also on the back end of the curve with slightly confusing investment signals for companies, right? I mean, look at the at the at the oil and gas majors that are trying to redefine themselves as utilities um, and sort of stopping some of their investments or rethinking a lot of their investments in fossil fuels, even though that's what they do best. And that is their money making um, sort of their, their best money making opportunities right now. And yet they're still having to transform. And you know what? We could be in a position in I think also kind of the current energy crisis reflects the transition towards the transition, right? The imperfect transition, so to speak, because in five years, we're, we could be in a situation where there have been less investments in fossil fuels. 
and so they become more expensive. But also, we don't have the full supply chains of copper, aluminum, hydrogen, methanol, all the new um, materials that we need, and so their prices are very high. And at that point, who pays for it? Is it markets, or is it you know? Obviously, it will be reflected through prices. But at what point does the the the, the state step in? And so I think this question to your question of winners and losers is probably a non-starter, or maybe it's not the way we should be looking at this. Um, obviously, there are clear winners, sort of the tech companies, hydrogen, everything that's a bit of a hype right now. But we can't afford to have losers to a certain degree. We need to have adaptation. I mean, you know, when I think about it in the China concept, the potential losers are the state-owned companies, not just oil and gas, but steel, cement, aluminum. Um, and it was a truism, and I think it still is in China watching, that the state doesn't lose. So, you know, how how do you square that circle? And so I think the point right. here is that, and it, I think it, it goes back to what Sarah was saying about economic opportunity. We have to help the so-called losers adapt. Now, is that solely through market mechanisms? I think we're clearly seeing that the markets can't judge alone, um, especially on the kind of future technologies and how which ones will win. You know, Monica, clearly, um we have seen that there's been a dramatic shift in attitudes globally, right? I mean, societies are demanding action because I think thanks to all of these things we've seen with the hurricanes and fires and floods, et cetera, as well as kind of the pandemic um, itself, you know, we're, we're, we're it, this is not a theoretical um, uh, anymore, uh, observationally, it's even to the average person on the, on the street. But despite what McCall's talking about, in many ways, sort of the invisible hand of the market has actually not solved these, uh, th this problem. It's not happening fast enough. And at the same time, one has to ask if, you know, if governments are actually really up to the, um, up to the task here. I mean, you know, um, listening to sort of the Larry Finks of the world who, who are sort of in the middle as investors find themselves as becoming kind of quasi regulators in a, in a way because Governments aren't up to the task and individual companies haven't been. And so I guess my question is, is do you think, um, you know, particularly in the in the Western democracies, that governments are up to the task here? And and were there lessons learned from from the pandemic that are actually applicable here? Because there have there were some remarkable successes. Probably the best would be Operation Warp Speed on the, um, you know, mitigating the risk of the uh, of the pharmaceutical companies to develop these vaccines at 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 at, uh, at, at fast speed, um, but also on you know PPE and 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 other elements. Um, what what was your what's your takeaway on that? Oh, you're on uh, mute. You're on mute. <laughs> Sorry about that. I have some uh, background noises, so that's why I muted myself. So, um, if I may, I just wanted to, before answering your, your question directly, make a couple of remarks about what I heard. I uh, actually believe that the European Union is probably the best uh, demonstration, no matter how hard the European Commission and uh, some European legislature tried, that market mechanisms are not enough. Uh, if we would not have had amazing legislation, very, you know, forward-looking um, in the 2007-8 on uh, renewables and energy efficiency and uh, mandatory reduction of emissions, we would probably not have developed, you know, uh, as much uh, the uh, uh, some clean energy technologies that we have today. We were afterwards uh, taken over by China, and that is uh, uh, very uh, something that is underlined very much by by the opponents of the green transition. The reality is that uh, through legislation and through uh, some kind of differentiated subsidies, uh, it was possible to push for something that market was not able to orientate just because, and this is of course only my opinion, uh, but I don't think that there is an invisible hand of the market. The market is guided and uh, demonstrates and shows a certain interest. This is certainly the case as far as energy is concerned. So it is not something that is completely neutral. And, uh, and therefore, if this is the case, then the fact of having ambitious legislation, very clear targets, once again, you know, the European Union has always been working on targets in terms of calendars and things like that. 
in some cases it was okay, in some cases it was not okay, but I think that that is the way through which we want we want, we move we move forward, and we were able to keep a little bit of leadership even when the United States failed us. And I think that that is something that uh, that is important in a way, because if, we, for example, if the European Union would not have had this famous Green Deal program, I have no idea what would have happened in the uh, during the pandemic, the, the, the pandemic. Uh, in terms of respect or interest to respect the targets uh, of, uh, of, of of our climate policies or the orientation of our financial uh, investments, so I think that that it's probably a question of, of approach. But I really believe that markets are not the solution, at least not the only solution, as as a lot of people say. I am very much in favor of carbon pricing. We have been doing a lot uh, around this in, in in Europe. It has been since the 90s, they tried to do it, and it was always stopped by the fact that we have big problems uh, in terms of decision making, in terms of uh, unanimity vote, etc. When very important financial and tax issues come, everything is blocked by one. And this is, of course, something that makes us much weaker. But I would say that this issue of carbon pricing must be balanced, on the other hand, by the fact that people must know where then these, these uh, gains, you know, this income from uh, carbon doesn't go. Uh, and I think that that is a very key issue in order to gain public support. Also, I wouldn't really say that the, the renewables underperformed in Europe. The problem is that they were not pushed enough. And uh, I believe that our dependence on, uh, on gas and fossil is something that is, is also a political issue and is also a political preference. Uh, that unfortunately uh, is there and has not been yet, uh, uh, you know, uh, taken away. Also, because you have to take into account that uh, there is another element that is very rarely mentioned, and that is the role of energy efficiency. Uh, you know, it was uh, uh, some time ago there was a very interesting study done by the European Commission, in which it was demonstrated that even if in industry in Europe um, spends much more in energy costs, you know, as higher energy costs. In terms of competitiveness, it is at the same level of the U.S. because the, the, the European industry, I'm talking, of course, about high industry, about uh, highly energy intensive industry, is much more efficient. So at the end of the day, in terms of competitiveness, you don't lose much. And there is now um, a very big plan, I'm not sure it will be realized, about renovation, it's called renovation wave, because it has been understood that if you don't work on buildings and if you don't make more efficient, then you can put as many renewables as you want, but you will not be able yeah. uh, with all the renewables of the world to solve the issue. So I think that, that uh, these are all questions that are important and just very briefly on the question of government attitudes. You know, not all governments are the same. I would say that in general, the European Union as such, meaning Commission and the majority of the Parliament, um, uh, are very much in favor of going forward, whereas there is a real resistance from the CHI, from the part of some of the member states, which says, if you want us to do this transition, give us money to do that, you know? And, uh, and so this is something that is, uh, is, uh, is also politically not always easy to deal with, uh, but I believe that the direction is that the only problem is the speed and whether or not we are going to be able to be convincing enough. It's also a democratic question. Uh, you know, it's not only an economic or a climate one. It's very much a, a political and democratic issue. So I want to ask um, a bit about, uh, and, and Monica, I want to start with you, and I'd be interested to hear what Sarah has to say on this as well, um, and, and bring the sort of the companies back into this again. So you know, as I said earlier, we've seen this sort of tectonic shift in uh, in capital allocation, right, towards sustainable funds vehicles, as an example, uh, from the S&P and the S&P sustainable indexes and, and the like. But one of the things that a lot of institutional investors and a lot of corporate leaders will bring up is, is that at the end of the day, this can't just be about public companies checking all of these boxes or, or moving in this direction, um, you know, uh, uh, and that you know, companies that are private, companies that are controlled by private equity, companies that are state-owned enterprises, companies that are controlled by venture capital, whatever the case may be, um, they have to be measured here 
you know, and held accountable um, as well. Otherwise, you can create these sort of sets of perverse incentives. Companies could go private um, or they could continue to sell off, you know, so-called dirty assets in an attempt to greenwash in a sense. So, so how do we make sure that this happens? Um, and I'm interested to hear what you and, and Sarah think. And then it also raises a question going into COP that McCall brought up earlier, uh, the taxonomy issue. We think that, you know, net, I mean, net zero is clearly a, a very, very powerful term. But do we all agree on actually what it what it means um, and, and, and how measurable it is? It seems like a unifying taxonomy would be one of the biggest positive things that could actually come out of this conference. But but Monica, let's let's start with you on these subjects. Yeah, thank you. On the issue of the companies, I, I believe that um, this, at least in Europe, because this is the place I, I know best, I don't know about the rest, but I would say that uh, uh, there is a sort of, you know, circle, the sense that uh, the companies are having a very big impact into the public debate and into the actions of governments. It's not only a question of bad lobbies or good lobbies, it's a question of really uh, being able in, uh, of, of orienting the, um, the, the decisions. So what is really key is that the companies that decided to go green, I mean, I'm sorry, I, it's a bit superficial, but let's say to go in that direction, I mean, to play positively, do have access exactly as the former monopolist or energy intensive industries, which are not all convinced of that direction. So at least in Europe, what is very important is to make visible that industry is not only one, and that there are different trends that uh, the policymakers have to really make sure they understand and they can regulate. In this sense, I insist that the regulation, democratically done, etc., is important also for companies. Some of them are asking to be to, to be regulated because so they know which direction they will have to go. And if mem if governments are not giving this direction. Is complicated, and in this sense, there is at least here at the in Brussels a very nice—that's nice. I mean, a very interesting uh, cooperation between civil society organizations and companies and business, which is going in, let's say, in the in the direction uh, of what I'm saying. And this is even more confirmed by the by, by the conversation which is taking care taking taking place now about taxonomy. You know, the European Union adopted a taxonomy regulation uh, a few months ago, and now there is a furious discussion about the, what we call delegated acts, the implementing regulation. I don't know about the legal name in the US, but why? Because, of course, now companies know that if, uh, if they can manage to make their, their activity to be labeled as green, it will be much easier to get investment. That's why now there is a big conversation about gas and nuke, gas in terms of transition and nuclear in terms of, I don't know what, uh, as sustainable uh, instruments, you know, to, uh, to be included in the taxonomy. But if you do that, it's not that, the problem is not that you can go on investing in gas and nuclear. The problem is, that if you label this as green, the whole exercise about taxonomy falls because it's not that tomorrow morning everything will be green, on the contrary, but at least you have to be serious in indicating what is not doing harm to the environment and is participating to the reduction of emissions. If you are blurred, then the whole uh, uh, discussion about not only a global but also European taxonomy that can be an example at global level will just fall. Sorry, about was a bit long. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Sarah? No, it was actually excellent. Uh, <laughs> so I don't have to say nearly as much in my answer because I agree with everything Monica just said. I mean, I do think we have to recognize that companies are making these decisions because, as McCall was talking about earlier, they've incorporated the risk. <laughs> Right. The idea here is there is a risk to not making this transition and they're going to have to be responsive, whether they're investors or companies, to being able to say they're addressing it. And so I, I do think it's important to recognize that it's not just a, 
um, environmental constraint that is being put on companies that somehow constrains them. It is actually meant to make them more competitive in a future where we think that the net zero you know, type of behavior that we're talking about is going to be more resilient, both because of transition risk and because of uh, you know, the, uh, potential impacts, right? So they're going to have to think about both of those things in their behavior. I think Monica pointed out a number of reasons why, though we cannot just look at this, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, corporate uh, activity, you know, ESG oriented activity as being the main vector for climate change, because when left to its own devices, it doesn't have the right signals from governments where it needs to be about questions of stringency and how to differentiate. You know, we all know that, you know, unabated coal emissions is on this side of the ledger and, you know, solar is on this side of the ledger. But in the middle, there's just so many shades of differentiation in the type of activity that you're doing that there needs to be additional signals for. I think this is going to be a dance that we go through for a period of time because companies are learning a lot about the emissions in their value chain. They're learning a lot about the return on investment for different business models for these types of you know, technologies, the future, not just distributed renewables, but, you know, what is the, you know, what is the green premium on, uh, on steel, uh, green steel these days? You know, we, we're learning a lot about, you know, what these industries of the future in a net zero context will look like. And it is going to require a lot of sort of back and forth conversation in collaboration between governments and industries to try to accelerate those markets. And so, I think this is another reason why it is really hard to see carbon pricing alone or market-based mechanisms alone being able to accelerate the market in the way that we know we're going to need to be able to meet the kind of climate targets that we're talking about. So that, that leads me to another uh, question um, uh, for both of you, and then I'd like to hear what McCall has to say from the other side of this, which is that we're not, you know, so to your point, we're not kind of not there yet. This is a process, right? And so... Um, it seems to me that the, you know, the current rules of global trade, you know, effectively subsidize um, carbon intensive production uh, overseas and deny benefits to U.S. Uh, to the U.S. from its competitive advantage with low, ma low emission manufacturing and so on. And so forth. because in places like China and India and Russia, et cetera, there are uh, laxer uh, environmental standards. So U.S. firms, in a sense, are at a um, uh, at a disadvantage. And so that rather than lowering you know, U.S. climate ambitions, the answer must be to encourage the U.S.'s trading partners to raise their standards and to, you know, and to penalize them for polluting. So it br brings up this other market question, which is carbon border taxes, uh, which has been floated in, in Europe. I know uh, there, are, there are proponents and opponents to this. Uh, clearly, this would be a big impact on China as well. Where do you guys where do you stand on on the viability of that and, and, and where and, and whether that's going to play a part here? Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll just say really quickly, it's also been floated in the U.S. in the context of the current legislation that we're debating. It's really hard to see um, how any country is going to make uh, genuine inroads in their hard to in their heavy industry sectors in terms of deep decarbonization and not try to protect those industries from competitive disadvantage, right? I mean, it is, I don't see a political way around that. I think the danger is that we could just see a lot of protectionism, you know, dressed up as being kind of environmental provisions. And so I, I think it's really important for us to think about, are there industries for which we need to have a different type of trade collaboration so that we encourage leading companies and leading industries to actually transition faster, right? And so you can think about steel or cement or aviation or shipping, where like it actually, you know, global collaboration to encourage those industries that want to lead, and it's not uniform across a country, right? There's probably, you know, some companies in China or in India that really do want to be leading a transition uh, to, to decarbonize whatever, you know, particular sector that they're in. How do we encourage those markets to develop? How do we work together as countries and companies to actually make sure that that happens? Because it is going to be a longer transition. It's not like a, you know, flip the switch overnight. We're inventing those technologies. We're putting them into the market. We're learning about how they operate together. We have to create those markets. And so I actually think that, you know, the European, you know, carbon border adjustment mechanism conversation 
in, at the best form has like sparked this conversation about, well, what are we going to do as we come into these unlevel playing fields and how are we going to work this out? And I think that, you know, thinking about potential like carbon clubs or ways to like do sector alignment in some of these, you know, heavy industry sectors that are trade exposed and high emissions is going to be one of the areas that we really have to explore as as a new frontier of collaboration in uh, in in the in sort of our efforts on climate. Michael, how would you characterize this coming from the perspective of, of China and say of may, many of the other large developing countries? I mean, you know, just on the on the carbon border adjustment mechanism, obviously, sort of China and developing countries will resist because it you know weighs on on their competitiveness and. It was no coincidence, I think, that China launched its emission trading scheme in July, just when the EU was, you know, was introducing the carbon border adjustment mechanism. So this is sort of an offensive a, a response to say, look, we're trying to deal with this. But, you know, I think there's a lot of ambiguity or not double standards, but, you know, we're talking about lax environmental standards. You know, China has a huge amount of control over processing of lithium batteries in large part because that is a hugely, a hugely damaging process from an environmental perspective. So not many other countries want to do that because of the impacts, and yet that is a critical part of the energy transition when we think about electrification and electric vehicles. So there are going to be huge challenges here. I think, you know, when we think about supply chains, when the pandemic first broke out, and obviously it started in China, and I remember having conversations with people saying, China can't deliver iPhones on time. There are going to be huge dislocations and companies wanting to leave China and replicate supply chains. And here we are, 18 months later, China is even more central to so many supply chains for a myriad of reasons, of course. But I think there are, you know, the, the, the global collaboration element here has to come in, in, into play with a real dialogue and a real conversation about the realities of the transition because it is extremely complex and sort of saying we are going to tax certain countries might be counterproductive. But I did also just want to pick up on what we were talking about earlier and, and the, the role of the state and the market. I think there's also sort of when we think about companies and how they can shape and help work with governments and, and financial institutions, it might be stating the obvious, but there's an asymmetry in policy influence, right? When you think about oil, gas, mining companies, they are spread across a huge supply chain, upstream, midstream, downstream. They're very global. They have huge operations that therefore require political connections or some form of political influence. You think about new new materials. Um, very few of them are globalized, right? You think it's more of a manufacturing thing or, or clean tech or demand side management. They're much more local, and therefore I think their political power is less, is, is sort of very different and potentially reduced to kind of the big corporations that now are engaging in the transition, and arguably they have less influence in the discussion. But I think a final comment, a uh, final observation as well, is that there is a huge challenge both for regulators and for companies because we don't know what the solutions really are. Right? So many of the technological solutions, and that's kind of part of what we're talking about supply chains, we just don't know the cost. We just don't know which ones we can pick. And therefore, everybody is groping in the dark with, I think, regulators having to give some signals, but markets then having to pick up. And it's an ongoing process that, again, I think just requires a huge amount of collaboration um, that today is extremely challenging. You know, yeah, if I, oh, sorry, Monica, if go ahead. Can I say something just on this question of carbon border adjustment? mechanism. So um, I think that we should do like the ancient Romans did, uh, that is to say that they understand that they they always uh, wondered, I mean, we are told that they always wondered uh, when they were making the law who we protest, you know, who is gaining from it. And I think that uh, that is exactly the point of this um, of this attempt. Uh, we are very, very long, uh, very long way away from the implementation of the carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism, unfortunately, I would say. But the idea here is not so much to create trade barriers, but to, uh, let's say, foster, as it happened in many other occasions, other countries to go the same way, you know, to the common agricultural policy or reach, you know, the, 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 the legislation on, uh, on chemicals, etc. It was said, ah, this will be a disaster for competition, this will be a disaster for market protection, etc. And at the end of the day, this was not the case, and it, this really played a very positive role. 
On the contrary, I think that the real issue of this uh, carbon border, border adjustment mechanism is that for the moment it is as it is thought, as it is proposed by the Commission, because this is a legislation process that has to go through, um, it is a little bit too weak, and on top of it, it is related to mechanisms for which uh, the emission trading system is working, but for which a lot of uh, uh, discounts and exemptions are still given to companies. So, if you have a carbon border adjustment, but at the same time you will have the advantage of being excluded by the ETS, sorry, eh, but then you are not really playing fair and also serious. And on top of it, we are not talking about it before 2026. So I think that before uh, having, you know, being fearful of this mechanism, we should actually think how to make sure that those companies that are going this green direction are not penalized and uh, at a global level, if you want, and uh, that uh, the, the, the kind of tariff uh, policies are actually reflecting the fact that certain imports are better than others. And, you know, it's a complex thing, but I wouldn't just put this issue of the carbon border adjustment mechanism as an issue concerning trade, although it is a trade mechanism, but it is also something you know, I want to use the last few minutes that we have here um, to go back to something that Michal alluded to a few minutes ago, and at the risk of opening up a whole new Pandora's box here on another complex subject. But I mean, you know, uh, one of the things that we learned most painfully throughout the 20th century, um, and frankly before for a long time, um, clearly the control of natural resources is key to, to, to geopolitical power, right? Um, and as the energy system changes, there are going to be changes in, in geopolitics. The world's going to be more electrified. We've already seen increased cyber risk and cyber threat, as an example. Um, you know, there's going to be further disruptions to what we think of as globalization. You know, we're going to, are we strengthening deglobalization or regionalization? The impact of climate change on, you know, on, on a lot of populations, the global refugee flows and, and, and the like. And the sources of competition, you know, we've, uh, oil has been in certain parts of the world, um, but we're now going to be looking at uh, increasingly these important metals, lithium and um, and copper and nickel and and, uh, and and et cetera, for these for these technologies. They are concentrated. They're concentrated in other parts of the world than the energy complex thus far has been. How do you see the geopolitical landscape changing? here, Michal, um, as we uh, as we move forward? I mean, the easy answer, at least from kind of where China sits, is that I think, you know, China is a prime position, well, to benefit from, from the energy transition, both because it does control a huge amount of supply chains of new minerals, right? It has access to a lot of the mining of cobalt and lithium. It does the processing in China. And, and you know, Chinese, Chinese decision makers realize over a decade, well, almost two decades ago, that they couldn't compete with traditional car makers and therefore they had to leapfrog to electric vehicles and try and control that supply chain. So I think they are very much ahead of the game um, on developing their access to, to critical materials and to the supply chains. But equally, and we have to bear in mind that developing countries are still growing, right? They still have development and economic activity for which they need fuel. And ideally, it would all be renewables, but renewables are not reliable enough right now until we build the storage capacities. If there is distributed renewable, there are a lot of solutions, but they are not perfect. And when you look at various outlooks for oil and gas demand, there's still growth in oil demand for perhaps the next decade, but certainly for gas for the next two decades. Um, and China, from where it sits, is still going to be a big importer of both. And increasingly, as Europe consumes less and imports less, then China is sort of the biggest demand source. And so it's critical for producers of oil and gas and critical in the supply chains for the energy transition. So obviously, you know, China looks at the vulnerabilities. The Chinese leaders look at the vulnerabilities associated with all of this. But, you know, when you look at it, it does have quite a, a strong and influential position in all supply chains, old and new. Hey Monica, do you have a view on this? Obviously, you know, as we look at, um, you know, the bigger concept yeah, the bigger of strategic concept. autonomy for Europe going forward um, in, in this environment where, you know, it's not necessarily a, a natural resource rich area. How do they how do they see this? 
Well, I think that this is a real issue and a real complicated point uh, that also in the public discourse is taking a big role uh, because people are saying, well, why should we waste our time to have uh, electric vehicles if they are also polluting? You know, so and, uh, and indeed they do have a point. So, of course, there are many ways to answer this. Well, you maybe go bike, for example, meaning that mobility should not only limit it to, to the question of, uh, of, uh, of cars or that you have to uh, make sure, as I was saying earlier, that your home, uh, instead of, uh, of uh, consuming 150 kilowatt hour per square meter every year, only consumes 50. You know, so in a way, there, are, there, are, there is a conversation about what to do to mitigate that kind of uh, problems. Of course, technology will maybe help us quite a lot. I understand that in the United States, there is already a lot of research done uh, also to reduce, to reuse battery, you know, much more. So I think that, um, I don't think that you ha can have a single, um, you know, silver bullet to solve all these issues. The question of resources is certainly uh, going to be very important. Uh, but what is for me very worrying is that oil and gas remain very relatively cheap, as it was called, and uh, also at the disposal of a lot of people in a lot of countries and uh, relatively comfortable. Um, and so I think that we have to make those products less comfortable and uh, less easy to, to, to get uh, if you want to, this process to go and to move, uh, to move forward. But uh, of course, these are really, you know, for example, uh, there was a very big conversation about what to do with the mines in Congo, you know, because the situation of workers there is a disaster and uh, we need that kind of, of minerals for a lot of our technology. So I believe that there is going to be a discussion of geopolitics, or there should be a discussion of geopolitics, which, whether we like it or not, brings in uh, issues like human rights, social rights, democracy, etc. And it's not only limited to trade and economics. Absolutely. We should probably do an entire call just on this subject. Um, my final question for the three of you is uh, maybe it's the most depressing question, but but you know it's okay. The weekend is right around the corner, so it'll be fine. But you know, um, as we as we head into COP26 here, it strikes me that there was also a recent UN report that essentially said that you know global average temperatures are going to rise by 2.7 degrees Celsius by 2100, even if all countries meet their promised emissions uh, uh, goals, um, which suggests that we're actually past the point of no return. That's depressing on the one hand, like I say, it's also, it's, it's, it's in, a, in a way, it's almost like a disincentive um, to, to make all of these efforts. So I, I guess my question is, alongside all of these mitigation efforts that we've been talking about throughout this call, do governments also really need to seriously start thinking about um, adaptation um, and for setting the political stage as well as the economic stage that parts of their parts of their countries parts some regions even some countries in their entirety like you think of small island nations like the Maldives may not be inhabitable later on this century um, by by people in the way we we think of today yeah, I think very briefly, I think that this is uh, very important and uh, I believe that it is inevitable to, to do that, to go very much like uh, towards uh, adaptation. I also believe that um, this issue about numbers and targets is very important to be had, but I believe that the, the reality shows, and this was the case last week in, uh, in, in Milan when there was the pre-COP, people were very that the movement and uh, you know a lot of people were again in the streets and there is a lot of mobilization that could be created that did play some role not a major role but some role and I think that uh, even if uh, numbers are not adding up there is not much more than we can do but I wouldn't take this as a de uh, motivating also because the alternative is going to be even worse even for our daily life so i i do have some hope uh, probably not for cop 26 as, as, as a resolutive uh, moment i fully agree with sarah cop are important but are not the only way to for, with which we make uh, the world more livable and more green and more happy sarah yeah i think there's a couple things i mean one we've known for a long time that we need to adapt and mitigate at the same time. 
but we have the same problem with both subject matters, which is we look at them as like costs we have to bear, not the things we have to do to take care of one another, right? If you look at unmitigated climate change where you don't pre-adapt, it is more expensive, you are on your back foot, and as a government, you are unprepared to do your job. As a company, you are unprepared to deliver for your shareholders. It is about preparing today for the things that we know are going to happen tomorrow, and that is just good planning, right? That is just responding to the world as we know it is going to be. And I think that, you know, it's really important for us to think about those things as the things we need to do to make sure the standard of living that we've been working for for decades as a global community don't recede, right? This is about not losing ground that we've gained. And there's a huge amount of opportunity in that as well. So I just think we have to stop thinking about it as there's a business as usual world where everything is fine as we have known it, you know, in the past. And that is just not the future we're talking about. So we either prepare for it and do something about it, or we're just going to be on the receiving end of volatility. And that does not seem like a very good strategic choice to me. And Michal, I'll give the last word to you on this. All right, I'll make it very brief. I think it's interesting, Sarah, you said not losing ground on what we've gained in standards of living. Developing countries, again, they're not there. Obviously, parts of China are very much there, but other places in the world are not there. So it is a very different narrative and outlook for them. But setting the stage for adaptation and maybe communicating it, sort of governments communicating it in the crudest terms of what could happen. And I'll try to end on an optimistic note. Maybe that will actually help to propel some more action towards the things that we do need to do. Well, this is a, a, a huge subject. Um, we are in, you know, and I've already violated the time, uh, the time limit here when my only job today is to land the, land the plane. But, um, you know, uh, we are going to continue this conversation going forward after COP well into next year. And I, and I should just say for our audience that, you know, to complement the extensive work that our team is already uh, doing on the ESG front, Taneo is launching uh, a new climate advisory product called uh, the Journey to Net Zero uh, to help our clients define, communicate and communicate on, uh, uh, on, on net zero plans. So for more information on that, please reach out to, uh, to us at uh, net dash zero at Taneo.com. Um, also, our next call in two weeks time, October 21st, uh, is going to be on a related subject. We're going to be looking at um, the future of air travel as it recovers from the pandemic, but also as it accounts for 2% of global emission, emissions, but one of the most difficult to turn green, uh, the sustainability um, challenges that are facing the industry. Uh, we will have um, Kaylin Robinescu, who's the former CEO and president of Air Canada, uh, and Amelia DeLuca, who is the uh, global head of sustainability for Delta Airlines um, on our call. So please join us. Um, until then, I want to thank everybody for joining today. Thank you, Monica Frasoni, Sarah Ladislaw, and Michal Madan. Really appreciate your time. Uh, hope everybody has a great weekend. Uh, and until next time, I'm Kevin Kajawara in New York. Thank you.